The scariest thing to the mind is the unknown. It's been said that nothing is scarier in this life than fear of the unknown. There is the unknown unknown. Things we don't know that we don't know. Things which are so foreign, so unimaginable that we even don't know that we don't know. But I claim there's an even more terrifying specter which haunts our world. Which is not the known unknowns, but the unknown knowns. Things we don't know, we know them. We know them, they are part of our identity, they determine our activity, but we don't know that we know them. This is what in psychoanalysis, of course, of course, is called unconscious, unconscious fantasies, unconscious prejudices, and so on and so on. And I think that this level is crucial. The unknown known is a rather awkwardly phrased way of getting at that category of knowledge which is forbidden to admit one even possesses. It's at the deepest layer of consciousness, the kind far enough away to miss entirely, but close enough to still hold sway over our thoughts and deeds. Let's just forget anything ever happened, okay? It's okay, he doesn't have any feelings. Racists don't have feelings. They're subhuman. From Software's Bloodborne, an offshoot of their popular Souls series, is a horror game in every sense of the word. It's arguably among the greatest works of gothic fiction slash cosmic horror of the last century, in fact. But I argue it's horrific aspects, not to mention the great fun and satisfaction of playing Bloodborne, stem not from a fear of the unknown, but rather out of confronting so-called unknown knowns. It might sound ridiculous to claim that anything in this game about wolf men and old squid gods is based in reality, but such a critique ignores the power of all fiction to imaginatively convey what is otherwise difficult or even impossible to directly confront, analyze, or accept. Now attention! This may have been a rooster diverted from some other part of the perimeter. In cultural production of all sorts, from highbrow to low, ideas are never formed in a vacuum. I mean, this episode is so intense and awesome, but um, do you think it's pro or con social media? Rather, they are byproducts of the individuals creating them, of course, but also of the larger culture they're born within. For example, as an idiomatic case of cosmic horror, Bloodborne was clearly not created in a vacuum. It comes from a tradition, a history, a lineage tracing all the way back to the controversial yet influential pioneer of the genre, H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft's work also provides a case of this principle in motion, albeit in a different sense. One cannot separate his fiction from his infamously virulent and explicit racism, since both were produced by ideas originating in the same mind. And as a product of a certain kind of society and historical moment, neither can one separate Lovecraft's racism from those larger cultural forces. Ergo, to the extent Lovecraft's work has relevance for any readership at all, one must ask how his real-world prejudices, as partial byproducts of a particular culture, connect with his stories and their significance for audiences. One must search for the sociopolitical facts reflected in his fiction to see why and how Lovecraftian horror matters or ever mattered to begin with. Welcome home, good hunter. What is it you desire? <laughs> To the extent Bloodborne is a modern take on Lovecraftian horror, an examination of their relevant commonalities and distinctions is also in order. In doing so, I hope to demonstrate, we will uncover what cosmic horror as a genre means today, and finally, what real-world structures and systems are explored by Bloodborne that could not, or at least were not, explored by Lovecraft. By the end, if I succeed, it will become clear that Bloodborne actually deconstructs, or inverts, many of the staples of Lovecraftian horror. What Lovecraft's fiction represses and fears, Bloodborne bravely confronts, namely the looming and ever-present unknown knowns undergirding modern capitalist society, which we all share by virtue of our time and place. In short, Bloodborne seeks to awaken the player to knowledge which we already possessed. It attempts to transform these unknown knowns into simple knowns as an act of liberation and resistance against their continued unchecked dominion over society and over people. What to do with that information, of course, is up to you.
But for these reasons, Bloodborne is a perfect example of the highest sort of social, moral, and philosophical good which video games and games alone as an interactive medium can achieve. The plant makes us human, makes us more than human. <laughs> defined the themes and obsessions of 20th century horror and as we chug on into the 21st century it doesn't seem to be going away. He let drop away all the trappings of, nor of what is called horror and he moved into some narrative peculiar to himself. He invented his own genre really. Lovecraft tells you about the scale of man in the cosmos. You know, so he is really the most articulate about uh, saying there is an indifference from the ancient gods to man. Lovecraft takes that and ups the ante. Lovecraft is often associated with the idea that fear of the unknown dwarfs all other kinds. Yet, as I briefly touched upon, one cannot separate Lovecraft's signature fear of the unknown from his racist outlook. In light of this, I argue Lovecraft did not so much fear the unknown as fear uncovering what, in fact, he knew and actively repressed all along. Lovecraft himself was a pretty crazy person. The most alarming tendency observable in this age is a growing disregard for the established forces of law and order. Whether or not stimulated by the noxious example of the almost subhuman Russian rabble, the less intelligent element throughout the world seems animated by a singular viciousness. Every artist with every work of art is a product of his or her time. And uh, he reflected a lot of uh, very American feelings. He had this really, this really archaic, um, unbudging idea that, that for society to be stable, then it had to be homogenous. He uh, just didn't like to see the culture he knew go down the drain, which he felt would happen just by erosion as, as more and more immigrants came. It's almost a Pat Buchanan kind of a thing. This absolutely genuine worry of the evils of breeding, of mixed breeding, <laughs> and breeding in general, I suppose. <laughs> you know, but the evils of taking purity with an almost Aryan sense of pride. Again and again in Lovecraft's fiction, we also find repressed awareness of what is human in that other, and conversely what is monstrous in the author's own racism. Not to mention the racism of his entire society, and the role it played ideologically in shaping that society, economically, politically, and culturally. His ridicule of the melting pot that was New York City reached manic, even racist levels. I certainly hope to see promiscuous immigration permanently curtailed soon. Heaven knows, enough harm has already been done by the admission of limitless hordes of the ignorant, superstitious, and biologically inferior scum of Southern Europe and Western Asia. For the most part, Lovecraft kept these views to himself, knowing full well that his friends and correspondents did not share his views. It wasn't long before his fiction gave voice to these demons. Red Hook is a maze of hybrid squalor near the ancient waterfront opposite Governor's Island. From this tangle of material and spiritual putrescence, the blasphemies of a hundred dialects assail the sky. Policemen despair of order or reform and seek rather to erect barriers protecting the outside world from the contagion. In the Mountains of Madness, for example, it's explained human beings were created to be slaves by a race of super advanced alien colonists known as the Elder Ones. It's bizarre that Lovecraft, who endorsed racial hierarchies and white supremacy, should write horror stories about so-called lesser beings enslaved by greater ones. I mean, that sounds more like a racist dream than a nightmare. Logically, it follows either Lovecraft must endorse a big fish eats the little one hierarchical picture without complaint, or he must accept the humanity of oppressed ethnic and cultural minorities. The fact that Lovecraft feared being dehumanized and enslaved by stronger beings while also endorsing racist ideas entails he was either heavily repressed or a complete idiot for not seeing that inconsistency. We now see plainly that the term dark in Lovecraft is resonant with a multiplicity of meanings. 
dark, in the sense of shadowy and mysterious, in the sense of demonic or horrifying, and yes, dark in the sense of the otherwise black and brown peoples and cultures who Lovecraft feared. But most of all, I claim, the term dark in his work connotes a blind spot in consciousness, a blotting out of the inner horrors of the self, particularly of white identity in this time period as experienced by a racist, a repression of the sheer logical inconsistency between his fiction and his politics, which of course undergirded that fiction. Lovecraft was terrified most of all of being confronted with the secret inner beast-like monstrousness and savagery of Lovecraft himself, and the larger culture which, after all, built itself atop chattel slavery and colonialization just as the Elder Things did. As Lovecraft's case demonstrates, all artistic and cultural products, regardless of register, tone, content, genre, or style, relate back to the real world, if they are to mean anything at all. But by Bloodborne's era of the early 21st century, that real world has changed since Lovecraft's era, at least a little. We've invented a kinder, gentler way. A different kind of thinking. Even if these problems, these deep-seated and possibly unavoidable gaps between human experience and expectation with the world around us have not gone away, we've gotten much better at repressing their knowledge. The unknown has become, in the 21st century, the unknown known. Of course, this has made things, ironically, much harder to live with. All around us, it seems, is confusion, bizarre events, and sudden outbreaks of horror. Things have taken on a decidedly gothic turn as of late, in fact. So in order to better our appreciation and understanding of this masterpiece of modern gothic lovecrafting and horror, Bloodborne, we'll need to take a deeper look into its essence and the essence of our time, beyond the veil of mere appearances, into this game's, into this reality's very heart and soul. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, quote, the main features involved in the Industrial Revolution were technological, socioeconomic, and cultural. One of these new creations was, quote, a new organization of work known as the factory system, which entailed increased division of labor and specialization of function, end quote. But the Industrial Revolution, as mentioned, was a revolution in society as well as in industry. As throughout history, in this case, great changes in human means of production generate changes in its ideas, its culture, and its dreams. Not just to the culture, but to the very fabric of society itself did these sweeping changes unfold. Quote, There were also many new developments in non-industrial spheres, including sweeping social changes, including the growth of cities, the emergence of new patterns of authority, and cultural transformations of a broad order. End quote. So you might say that humanity itself was changed in this process, but this revolution, unlike most of the political sort, was not quick and brutal. It did not remake history overnight, rather it occurred in waves, through leaps and bounds rather than in one fell swoop. Arguably this is a much more effective model for revolutions to take place, and stay in place. So this revolution was not localized to its first era, being from 1760 to 1830. According to Professor Joel Mulkier, professor of economics and history at Northwestern University, quote, the second industrial revolution is usually dated between 1870 and 1914. Unlike the first wave of industrialization, Professor Mulkier writes, the second industrial revolution was defined not by sheer, quote, technological progress, but rather by, quote, improvements in product quality, which depends much more on the smaller, cumulative, anonymous changes known as micro-inventions, end quote. Yet, Mokir continues, the great path-breaking inventions in energy, materials, chemicals, and medicine were crucial not because they themselves had necessarily a huge impact on production, but because they increased the effectiveness of research and development in micro-inventive activity. Eventually, such activity, like everything else, runs into diminishing returns unless a major new breakthrough opens new horizons." End quote. Yet, as Lovecraft's work attests, these new horizons, which invariably open up with every major new insight or method, are not always for the betterment of society. 
even if they usually lead to enriched productivity, new kinds of products, and higher levels of capital for the factory owners, bureaucrats, tycoons, and the like, you might say the more these kinds of people thrive and profit, the more they build up these technological means of production, the more the working class is squeezed and squeezed until little but a blood-soaked flesh bag remains. Though the Second Industrial Revolution began in 1870 and was a worldwide phenomenon, it's arguably inseparable from the British society which birthed it, the Victorian era. But it wasn't just the Second Industrial Revolution which the Victorians spawned. It was in the Victorian era that Englishness as an ideal was born at least as it's known in the modern world. According to this summary provided by the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, quote, the period saw the rise of a highly idealized notion of what is English or what constitutes an Englishman. This notion is tied very closely to the period's models for proper behavior and is also tied very closely to England's imperial enterprises. Many colonists and politicians saw it as their political and sometimes religious duty to help or civilize native populations in colonized regions. But what really drove this newfound English character? It was the institution of a new social strata, namely the middle class. From the same article, quote, The middle class at the time was increasing both in number and power. Many members aspired to join the ranks of the nobles and felt that acting properly according to the conventions and values of the time was an important step in that direction. End quote. The new value of the day was progress. Yet something essential was lost, if it ever existed, in this mad rush towards British supremacy, towards progress. Society became more repressive, buttoned down, and chaste than ever before. Sexuality, for example, was all but forbidden, even if it was tolerated a bit more for men than for women. It was from this dehumanizing set of values that gothic horror as a genre was born, alongside the revival of gothic styles and British architecture around the same time. As these literary and architectural works can attest, both of which, by the way, were produced by the new tension between modern life and religious thought, what really terrified the Victorians was their own bodies and minds. We might come to understand the Victorian moral code better as a byproduct of a society resplendent with contradictions. To keep up with the modern global economy, the British resorted to all manner of barbarous and decidedly unchristian tactics. Yet, it was necessary to inspire the working class with myths about British exceptionalism and history, to give them hope by way of Christian dogma. Ergo, the Victorian class emerged as a cultural embodiment of the notion of unknown knowns. How much easier is it to cling to lies, to dreams of a better world, to self-righteousness, to things like the white man's burden, and all of that, than it is to admit to oneself, or collectively as a society, that morality arises not from one's nature, but from one's actions. This is a much scarier proposition, which requires constant vigilance, self-scrutiny, and hard work, whereas the doctrine of white, British, or Christian supremacy only requires that one be born with the quote-unquote right skin color and culture. So the Victorian era was a long-lasting one. As Professor J. Forbes Farmer of the Franklin Pierce University Sociology Department writes in his comparison piece of the two great rivals of political thought of the period, quote, In Das Kapital, Marx stated his objective as being to lay bare the economic law of motion of modern society. Major illusions were uncovered as Marx went about this task, end quote. For example, quote, the exploitative system of surplus extraction could be argued to lead to a maldistribution of wealth and power, albeit in an invisible form, end quote. This and other claims Marx made ironically via, quote, an insistence upon use of the scientific method. Marx's task was extracting the rational kernel, the reality beneath the mystification, which capitalism as an ideology demands. Everyone knows and agrees that the 20th century was one of the darkest, most dangerous, and bloodiest times in the history of mankind. Many people all over the world were persecuted and exploited because of ruthless competition. The ideological foundation that led to such troubles, disorder, war, and conflict in the 20th century, and to hatred and enmity among people, was social Darwinism. He proposed that all living things are engaged in a supposedly ruthless struggle for survival. He even claimed on the basis of no scientific evidence whatsoever that the same ruthlessness also applied to human societies. 
When applied to society, Darwin's theory of evolution emerged as social Darwinism. With social Darwinism, an extremely perverted worldview was spread, to the effect that life is a supposed struggle, and that human beings need to win that struggle, or at least survive, in that brutal environment. In this way, it became the basis for totalitarian and bloody ideologies such as savage capitalism and racism that ignores social justice and invariably promotes moral degeneration and a great many other scourges. White Western society struggled with rationalism as an ethical and ideological dogma until it discovered via Darwin a method of not just excusing, but rather justifying itself of all wrongdoing and extolling its own race, culture, and history as supreme in the process. Alongside other scientific and technological advancements, the second industrial revolution occurred, clearing a path for even further development of a powerfully efficient, productive, amoral social order. Yet. That very same privileging of reason and science above all other modes of thought also armed alternative thinkers. Most people agree that we need to improve our economic system somehow. Yet we're also often keen to dismiss the ideas of capitalism's most famous and ambitious critic, Karl Marx. This isn't very surprising. In practice, his political and economic ideas have been used to design disastrously planned economies and nasty dictatorships. Nevertheless, we shouldn't reject Marx too quickly. We ought to see him as a guide whose diagnosis of capitalism's ills helps us to navigate towards a more promising future. Capitalism is going to have to be reformed, and Marx's analyses are going to be part of any answer. Mostly, Marx wrote about capitalism, the type of economy that dominates the Western world. It was, in his day, still getting going, and Marx was one of its most intelligent and perceptive critics. These were some of the problems he identified with it. Modern work is incredibly specialised. Specialised jobs make the modern economy highly efficient, but they also mean that it's seldom possible for any one worker to derive a sense of the genuine contribution they might be making to the real needs of humanity. Marx argued that modern work leads to alienation, entfremdung, in other words, a feeling of disconnection between what you do all day and who you feel you really are and what you think you'd ideally be able to contribute to existence. Modern work is insecure. Capitalism makes the human being utterly expendable, just one factor among others in the forces of production and one that can ruthlessly be let go the minute that costs rise or savings can be made through technology. And yet, as Marx knew deep inside each of us, we don't want to be arbitrarily let go. We're terrified of being abandoned. Workers get paid little, while capitalists get rich. This is perhaps the most obvious qualm that Marx had with capitalism. In particular, he believed that capitalists shrink the wages of the labourers as much as possible in order to skim off a wide profit margin. He called this primitive accumulation, ursprüngliche Akkumulation. Marx insists that at its crudest, capitalism means paying a worker one price for doing something and then selling it to somebody else at a much higher price. Profit is the fancy term for exploitation. Capitalism is very unstable. Capitalist crises are crises of abundance rather than, as in the past, crises of shortage. Our factories and systems are so efficient, we could give everyone on this planet a car, a house, access to a decent school and a hospital. And that's what so enraged Marx, but also made him so hopeful too. Few of us actually need to work, because the modern economy is so productive. But rather than seeing this need not to work as the freedom it is, we complain about it masochistically, and describe it by a pejorative word, unemployment we should call it freedom. There's so much unemployment for a good and deeply admirable reason, because we're so good at making things efficiently. We're not all needed at the coalface. But in that case, we should, thought Marx, make leisure admirable. Capitalism is bad for capitalists. Marx didn't think that capitalists were evil. For example, he was acutely aware of the sorrows and secret agonies that lay behind bourgeois marriage. Marx argued that marriage was actually an extension of business and that the bourgeois family was fraught with tension, oppression and resentment, with people staying together not for love but for financial reasons. Marx believed that the capitalist system forces everyone to put economic interests at the heart of their lives so that they can no longer know deep, honest relationships. 
He called this psychological tendency commodity fetishism, Waren fetishismus, because it makes us value things that have no objective value. He wanted people to be freed from financial constraint so that they could at last start to make sensible, healthy choices in their relationships. Why don't we all think a bit more like Marx? An important aspect of Marx's work is that he proposes that there's an insidious, subtle way in which the economic system colours the sort of ideas that we end up having. The economy generates what Marx termed an ideology. A capitalist society is one where most people, rich and poor, believe all sorts of things that are really just value judgments that relate back to the economic system. For example, that a person who doesn't work is worthless, that leisure beyond a few weeks a year is sinful, that more belongings will make us happier, and that worthwhile things and people will invariably make money. In short, one of the biggest evils of capitalism is not that there are corrupt people at the top, this is true in any human hierarchy, but that capitalist ideas teach all of us to be anxious, competitive, conformist and politically complacent. People, at least large masses of people, only accept irrational beliefs and modes of thought if they are conditioned, compelled, or otherwise taught to, the Victorians were, in this regard, slaves to their own way of thinking. As I've endeavored to prove with all this evidence, it is unlikely that Bloodborne's setting, story, mechanics, and overall presentation are coincidentally based in Victorian style and sensibilities. Nor, I claim, is this done in Bloodborne merely to fulfill genre expectations. Such a proposal does a disservice to this masterpiece, because it implies that no meaning or deeper essence exists beyond Bloodborne's surface level, which, I doubt I need mention, flies in the very face of the entire game's thematic and narrative underpinnings. According to the amazing lore analysis document The Pale Blood Hunt by Redgrave, quote, Hidetaka Miyazaki, the genius behind the Souls franchise, grew up in poverty in the city of Shizuka. Unable to afford any means of entertaining himself, Miyazaki spent most of his childhood reading books in his local library. He was fascinated with Western fiction, but he lacked fluency to understand every word. Many times he would read a story without understanding even half of it, so he would connect the words he could find and fill in the blanks, forming a story of his own that used the pieces that had been laid out before him." End quote. So the question I think Bloodborne implicitly raises, through Redgrave's key observation, is this. Are not all citizens in hyper-capitalist, dog-eat-dog style, neo-social Darwinist societies much like Miyazaki was as a child, regardless of their linguistic abilities? Is not modern capitalist society, particularly in the West, a kind of shared illiteracy of our own stories, history, of our own reality? You're sure to be in a fine haze about now, but don't think too hard about all of this. Just go out and kill a few beasts. It's for your own good. Without the pieces spelled out for us, by being forced to, in Redgrave's phrasing, use the pieces that have been laid out before us, are we not thereby subject to sudden horrifying bouts of confusion, depression, guilt, and unexplainable events of shame? Are we not thereby rendered prey for the powerful to dine upon, rendered fodder for a world that, as more and more of its options disintegrate for people, resembles more of a nightmare than so-called reality? Are we not, like the player character in Bloodborne, forced to become the very monsters we simultaneously must believe with every waking moment are distinct from ourselves? Is not the dog-eat-dog -dog society formerly championed by social Darwinists more and more the exact picture of modern life for those of us without wealth, without futures, and without hope? In Bloodborne, though the details are scarce and incomplete, it's clear that the citizens of Yarnum summon forth, either out of need, religious ceremony, or desire, the very monsters who come to destroy their world and turn them all into hideous beasts. Is this not the perfect description for the scenario we in the West increasingly find ourselves in? Is not the game's obsessive attention to detail when it comes to architecture, technology, fashion, and society an attempt to artistically simulate or recreate the ideology and times of Victorian England? And is not that exact era the origin point, the start 
of modern capitalism, the place where the blood-soaked nightmare was first born? Is this not exactly the kind of mass illusion, mass unconsciousness, thinkers like Marx argue prevent real change or realization of the state of things? Do not the various humanoid enemies in the game attack the player character relentlessly, calling us beasts and seem totally blind to their own disfigured visages? Is this not the perfect metaphor for capitalism throughout history from today all the way back to its origin in the 18th century? Finally, is not the entire enterprise of accumulating power, prestige, fashion, culture, technology, and history an attempt to repress a realization of our own base animal nature? An attempt to repress what our blood-soaked births, screaming and crying in terror at the bright cold world we're torn into betrays? A desire to run from the deeper truth of humanity and life's essentially violent, cruel, unexplainable, and yes, often horrific nature? I submit to you, dear viewer, the answer to all these questions is, of course, in the affirmative. I claim that Bloodborne is much more than a game simply about collecting insight points and blood echoes, or about ramping up the player's power, level, and technology to best one foul demon after the other. It's more, for that matter, than a rote Lovecraft homage or fulfillment of the gothic tradition, aesthetically. Bloodborne means more than all of that because, like all great art, as I said at the onset, it speaks to the times it was made in. And these are very dark times, indeed. To paraphrase Friedrich Nietzsche, beware when fighting monsters, that we ourselves do not become monsters. For when we gaze long into the abyss, the abyss gazes into us. Fear the old blood, indeed. Any questions?